Father, your word says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And really that's the focus here in John 17 of the prayer of Jesus. And Lord, just open it up to our hearts and our lives. Help us to draw close to you. And Lord, again, wherever we're at, you know, Lord, you know what we need to hear. You know what we need to do. Just show us, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Encourage us, Lord, in the walk we have. And Lord, we just want to honor you through our worship and the teaching of the word this evening. We pray that each of us are open to your spirit's leading. And Lord, help us to leave your changed people. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17 as we're continuing our study through the word of God. And we're several hours away from the crucifixion of Jesus as he's continuing to instill in his men the things of God. Why? Well, so they can carry on the work after his departure. He's going soon. And remember, Jesus and his men, except for Judas, finished the Passover meal together. They've left the upper room where they had the meal. And they were making their way through the streets of, of Jerusalem, past the temple, towards the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. They haven't crossed over the book Kidron yet. They're still in that temple area, but they're preparing. And we'll see that as we finish up this evening. Now, John chapter 17 is one of those great chapters to me. Uh, it's the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, people, when they think about the Lord's Prayer, what do they think about? Well, they think about Matthew chapter 5, right? Um, or 6, excuse me, where Jesus said, you know, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. That's really not the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's a pattern to pray by, but it's not a formula to pray by, you know. Uh, people have made it into a formula. It's a pattern. You know, understand, our Father in heaven, and, you know, we went through this as we went through Matthew 6, but just the relationship, where who he is and who we are. Um, but the Lord's praying, the Lord's prayer, man, here in John chapter 17, an amazing chapter. And we see in the first five verses, in verses one through five, Jesus is praying for himself. In verses six through 19, he prays for the apostles. And I love the last section, verses 20 through 26, because Jesus prays for the church in the world. He prays for all believers. He prays for you and me. That's an amazing thing. I mean, did you ever think about that? Creator of heaven and earth was praying for us. It is praying for us, interceding for us. And, you know, so you look at, the prayers in the scriptures, there are some awesome prayers in the Bible. You know, you got Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 as he intercedes for Sodom. In Exodus chapter 32, the prayer of Moses as he intercedes for the children of Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 8, the prayer of Solomon as the temple is dedicated. Nehemiah in chapter 1, interceding for his people. Daniel chapter 9, and again, in interceding for the Jewish people and the return home from captivity. And as powerful as those prayers are, and they are, this one is far outshines all of them. It's the prayer of Jesus. It's kind of the holy of holies of prayers, you might say, because our great high priest is making intercession for his people, for you and me. To kind of give you an idea of how great this prayer is, Marcus Rainsford, who worked closely with D.L. Moody, he wrote this. He said, the whole prayer is a beautiful illustration of our blessed Lord's intercession at the right hand of God. Not a word against his people, no reference to their failings or their shortcomings. No, he speaks of them only as they were in the Father's purpose, as in association with himself, and as the recipients of the fullness he came down from heaven to bestow upon them. All the Lord's particular petitions for his people relate to spiritual things. All have reference to heavenly blessings. The Lord does not ask riches for them or honors or worldly influence or great preferments, but he does most earnestly pray that they may be kept from evil, separated from the world, qualified for duty, and brought home safely to heaven. Soul prosperity is the best prosperity. It is the index of, index of true prosperity. Absolutely. I, I like that. You know, do we fail? We fail all the time. But the Lord, man, he just looks at us and wants to bless us. J. Vernon McGee kind of gives us some quotes from different Christians about this section. Matthew Henry said, It's the most remarkable prayer following the most full and consoling discourse ever uttered on earth. Martin Luther said, 
This is truly beyond measure a warm and hearty prayer. He opens the depths of his heart, both in reference to us and to his Father, and he pours them all out. It sounds so honest, so simple. It is so deep, so rich, so wide. No one can fan from that. One of the reformers said, There is no voice which has ever been heard, either in heaven or in earth, more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more sublime than the prayer offered up by the Son of God, or by the Son to God Himself. For John Knox, this is a prayer he read over and over and over in his lifetime. And when he was on his deathbed, he asked his wife, or his wife asked him, excuse me, where do you want me to read? And he said, read where I first put my anchor down in the 17th chapter of John. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And I think, you know, great comfort is found as we look at these verses and we see what the Lord is praying about. You know, Jesus knows what's ahead of him, right? And he's going to the cross of Calvary. He's going to be crucified for the sins of the world. The Father's going to break fellowship with him when the sins of the world are placed upon him. And so the intense pain of crucifixion, the, the beatings he had to endure, the separation that Jesus never experienced in eternity past or will experience in eternity future. And think about all that's going on in his mind and in his life. I mean, Judas is getting ready with a, probably a thousand people, 600 soldiers plus, to arrest him. And Jesus takes time to pray. Wow. That kind of hit me. You know, when we're going through difficult times, when things are overwhelming in our lives, when we're so busy, we're like, man, I just don't have time to pray. Wrong. That's exactly what we need to do. To take that time. Follow the example of Jesus and pray. Bring your request before the Father. Lay them at his feet and rest in him. This is a great example for us to follow in our lives. And we, in a sense, are privileged to listen in on this conversation that Jesus is having with the Father. And so, with that in mind, let's pick up John chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we go through his word. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Now, we are coming to the reason that God became flesh and dwelt among us to pay the debt of our sin. It's something we could never pay. And not only pay it, but pay it in full. The work is completed. The hour had come. And I'm, you know, think about it. If the work wasn't completed, if it was up to us, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? None of us would know if we'd make it. And I probably could safely say none of us would make it if it was up to us. But he said it is finished. He completes the work. And again, look at what he's praying. We, we tend to think about prayer, you know, if we pray for ourselves, we're being selfish. Jesus prayed for himself here. It's not being selfish. Don't we need prayer? Shouldn't we be praying, Lord, you know, this is going on in my family. I need help here. Absolutely. And as you read this, this is not a prayer from man to God. This is the God-man, Jesus Christ, coming before the Father. They are equals. One writer put it like this. He said, the request of our Lord thus given in John 17 chapter is clearly no prayer of an inferior to a superior. Constantly there is seen in it the co-equality of the speaker with the Father. The two have but one mind. Where the Son speaks, he is not seeking to bend the Father to him. Rather, is he's voicing the purpose of the Godhead. Exactly. And the focus here is the cross, the symbol of humiliation to the world, but by it the Son's going to be glorified. And you think, well, how 
I mean, crucifixion was brutal. It, it was humiliating. As many times they would uh, put these people on the crosses naked, hanging there for all to see. How's the Son glorified in that? Because it was an act of obedience unto the Father. And by it, the Father is also glorified. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Why do we do things? To get the attention, to get you know the praise of man? Why do we serve the Lord? When I was in uh, Florida several years ago, I was in Fort Lauderdale and I did a lot of walking around. I like to walk and I like to run, but I was just walking around and checking out stores because uh, we were in the hotel at that time and uh, needed some food. And here was this synagogue. And I, it, it was a nice looking synagogue, but on every door, window, was the person's name who purchased it. This door dedicated to I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it was everywhere. It wasn't like just on the door, front door. It was on every window and everything that was hanging out there. I'm thinking, how does that glorify God? You're getting all the glory now. And see, as Christians, what we do, we bring glory and honor to Him. It's not about us. In fact, we couldn't do this apart from Him. I, I truly dislike the Christian award shows. Who enabled you to sing that song, write that song, perform that song? It was God. But now you're getting a little award. So enjoy it because that's your reward. You're glorifying yourself. You're not glorifying the Father in heaven. Let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That's what it's about. And as soon as we take on that glory, we're in trouble. Be careful. Don't do that. And I realize that many times people see the things we do. And they don't understand it. My family doesn't understand how I can do this week in and week out. They don't get it. They shake their heads. Yeah, I'm just excited to be able to serve God and to be able to share God with you guys, God's word with you guys. And it's all about him. He gets the glory, not me. And the world may not understand us, but they see something different in us. At least they should. I remember one guy, one musician, and he's pretty famous. And he was going to come and do worship for us on a Sunday. And why people do this, I don't know. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Don't do this. I'm walking up to the pulpit to do opening prayer. And he comes alongside of me, and we're walking down the aisle. And he goes, hey, don't forget to mention I'm in the Christian uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Really? Really? You're telling me that now? There is no way that's going to happen. And I was very disappointed in the worship because I asked him to sing songs in which we can participate in, and he sang his own songs. Hey, we're here to worship God. It, we're not, if we were doing a concert, that's great. Do your own songs. Or if you wanted to do one or two of them, that's fine. He's never been back. Now, how does Jesus glorify the Father? Well, by the work he's doing. Right? We'll see that in the next few verses. He gives eternal life to those who believe on him. The Father sent Jesus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. The Father sent Jesus to pay for the sins of man. And when the work was completed, as men come to Jesus Christ, the Father is glorified. Wow. Well, look at the next verse, verse 2. Just back up a little into verse 1. That your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, 
that he should give eternal life to as many as who have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Who has authority over all flesh? Jesus said that the Father has given him this authority over all flesh. And he has the ability to give eternal life to man. He's Almighty God. He's the only one that could do that. Only God can give eternal life. He has the authority over mankind. He's the creator of all things, guys. Now, here in verse 3 where it says that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's where it gets a little tricky now. Hmm. As many as you have given him. Does that mean God has predestined some people for heaven? Those that he gave to Jesus to save and some people for hell? Those he didn't. Well, in a sense, it's partly true. God does predestine us for heaven, but there's man's responsibility that's there as well. To receive that gift of eternal life that's found in Jesus or to reject it. You see, and this is really not a compound, it's just a reality, it's 100% God's sovereignty. And it's 100% man's free will. I know it's 200%, but that's just the way it is. And if you think that's difficult, how is God fully man and fully God in the incarnation? You see, you're trying to understand something about God that our minds just cannot figure out. But that's what the scriptures teach. And for a lot of people, they're either on one side or the other. Predestination or free will. They don't get that it's all of it together. The bottom line is this, and I've talked with enough uh, Reformed theology people who just believe God predestined some people for heaven and some for hell. But the reality is, if God predestined you for hell, when you go to hell, you could blame God. You didn't predestine me. It's your fault. Is that true? No, it's not God's fault. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see, it's not God so loved the entire world, all the people, that he gave his son. And whoever believes in him. It's not limited. He didn't say to those who are predestined. Whoever believes in him. I like that. And think about it, you know, if God made you go to heaven, that's a, not a love relationship. And that's not the heart of God. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I, we have a choice to open up our hearts to him. It's not like, you know, we open the door and there's Jesus and goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm at the wrong house. I didn't predestine you. No, there's the choice. And some go, well, that's not fair. Well, it is very fair. You have a choice to come to Christ. And if you come to Christ, you're predestined. If you're not, you're not predestined. It's as simple as that. He doesn't create us for hell. He really creates the devil and his demons. That's what hell's all about for them. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. All. It's an invitation. John 7, verses 37 and 38. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. There's the invitation again. Come to me. You have a choice. And I may not be able to reconcile it completely in my mind, but that's what the scriptures say. 
in Hebrews 2.9. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for only those who are predestined. No, it says for everyone. Huh. He died for everyone, but you have to receive that free gift of life by coming to Jesus, repenting of your sins. Acts 17.30, there's a lot of these. Truly these times of ignorance got overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Well, if he's calling everyone to repent, that means everyone has a choice to make. John 5.40, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Choice again. You are not willing. You're rejecting it. 1 John 2.2, 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Wow. Not just a select few. And again, it's, it's a difficult concept. God's sovereignty, man's free will. But they go side by side. It's not, you know, 75% sovereignty, 25% free will. It's 100%. And, I, you know, I've used this illustration before, but it's like railroad tracks. You've got sovereignty, you've got free will. You put the train on those tracks, and they take the train to the destination because the tracks are parallel to each other. They don't cross over. They don't intersect. They, they're parallel. And you need both of them. So I think, you know, to me it's clear. If you want eternal life, then you have to come to Jesus. Because he's the only one who can give eternal life. That's where it's found. Outside of Christ, separation, death, lake of fire. And, and I like, you know, what it, that when it says here in John 17 that they may know you. In the Greek, the way it's put is it, this is a knowledge of growing experience. Think about it. When you first got saved, do you know more today than you did when you first got saved about God? I hope so. I hope so. We grow in the Lord. We get to know him daily through the experiences, through the word. Well, look at verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, Jesus said, I finished the work which you have given me to do. Wait a minute. He didn't finish it yet. Right? He didn't go to the cross yet. They're still on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. How could, it say, how could he say that he finished the work? Because there is nothing that was going to stop Jesus from completing what was before him. When God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. You could be sure of that. And you could look at that in our own lives. The work of transformation and perfection, it's seen as already complete. In Romans 8.30, Paul said, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Well, Paul, in speaking of glorification, is speaking in the past tense. We're already glorified. Oh, man. I look at my life and, oh, man, you've got a ways to go here. Right? Paul speaking of something that hasn't taken place yet with such certainty because it's not based upon what? It's not based upon man's faithfulness. It's based on the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's why Paul said, spoke of it in the past tense. If this was based upon our individual actions, Paul could not say that. And none of us, again, like I said before, would make it. But I love, you know, Paul in Rome, or excuse me, in Philippians 1 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a work in you will complete it 
until the day of Jesus Christ. Wow. Who's going to complete it? Me? No, he's going to complete the work in me. His spirit is going to enable me to do the things that I need to do. It's not going to be done by my might, my strength, my power. It's going to be the power of God working in my life. I mean, we'll see that when we get to the book of Acts next year. We'll see how these disciples of Jesus, Peter, couldn't even say he knew the Lord. And then all of a sudden, they're empowered by the Holy Spirit and what? Look at the boldness of Peter and the disciples' lives. They were cowering in a room, hiding from the Roman soldiers. All of a sudden, something's changed. They're now proclaiming Christ in a bold way. Wow, God is working. In verse 5 here in John 17, Jesus said, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Isn't that interesting? Did Jesus lose glory? Well, in a sense, he emptied himself. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2 for a second. Let me share this with you. Philippians 2, we're going to look at verses 6 through 11. This is what Paul said. He said, Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation or emptied himself of his privileges, taking the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and, gi and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Again, that phrase, made himself of no reputation, speaks of him emptying himself. What did he empty himself of? Of the rights he had as being deity, he took on the body of a man. Yes, he was fully God, but some of his godly attributes he laid aside. It wasn't that he was 50% God and 50% man. Like I said, 100% God and 100% man in the incarnation. And here in John... 17, verses 1 and 5, it says he emptied himself of his divine glory. He emptied himself of his divine authority in John 5.30. He emptied himself of some of his divine attributes. He did not stop being omniscient or all-knowing. He didn't you know, stop being all-powerful or immutable. But he laid those things down in his earthly ministry. And doesn't Jesus get up early to pray and seek direction from his Father? Why does he have to do that? Because he freely emptied himself of some of those attributes. It did make him less than God. He was still fully God. He also emptied himself of eternal riches. He became poor in the incarnation, a servant of all. He had emptied himself when he became flesh and blood uh, of his... Uh, intimate relationship with the Father when he was hanging on the cross bearing the sins of the world. And now what do we see Jesus here doing in John 17? He's asking the Father to restore the glory that he had before the incarnation. And of course that happened. Tenney put it like this, he said, he had one main petition, that the Father would receive him back to the glory he had relinquished to accomplish his task. This petition for a return to his pristine glory implies unmistakably his pre-existence and equality with the Father. It confirms his claim that he and the Father are one, absolutely. So, receiving that glory he once had with the Father, the equality. In fact, in Isaiah 42.8, the Lord said, I am the Lord. That's my name and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. So if Jesus is asking for glory and he's not God, something's wrong. Because God says, I'm not giving my glory to anyone. But he is God. In fact, in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, John tells us, in the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. 
because he is God. Now, Jesus moves from his prayers for himself. Now he's going to pray for his disciples. Look at verse 6. I have manifested or revealed your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Wow. These are the men that the Father had given to Jesus. And he, I mean, these guys had to be encouraged by this. I mean, Jesus has given them a whole lot of information. He's departing. He's going away. Where, where he's going, they can't come, at least not yet. And now Jesus is just encouraging them doesn't mention their failures, their mistakes. He knew them, but he's trying to encourage them. And he says, I've manifested your name to the men you have given me out of the world. And the whole idea is there, not necessarily verbally. Did Jesus do that? Did he teach them verbally? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what the, the point that Jesus is making here is that he lived what he believed. The nature of God flowed through his life. They saw the Father in Jesus. And I think that's important to us. You know, we, verbally, we, yes, we're to share Jesus with people, but are we to live in such a way that people will see Jesus in us? Yeah, we should be. And, you know, see some things, you know, man, I see some things on Facebook from Christians. I'm like, please just take it down. That shouldn't be there. You know, but again, you know, our witness, when people read our lives, what are they reading? Because how many of unsaved people do you see carrying a Bible and reading it? But they'll read your life. They'll see something different in you. And maybe it'll spark a question or give you an opportunity to uh, share something with them by the way you live, by the things you say, the things that you do. Very important. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. It says Jesus is not praying for the world. Isn't that kind of harsh? What do you mean you're not praying for the world? There's a lot of people in the world. Why aren't you praying for them? Well, he's not praying for the world system. That's what it's really about. He's praying for the people, of course, but not for the world system. He wants the people saved out of that system. And... I think a lot of times what we as Christians like to do is to change the system. I think you change the system by changing people. But you try and change the system without changing the people, and it's a mess. You doubt that? Go look at Washington today. Not going to happen. I mean... People love to have attention drawn to them. They'll do all kinds of things to get that. But in the end, man, you're in trouble. Remember Herod in Acts 12? It says Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord. Having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their county was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, array, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of man. Yeah, look at me. <laughs> yeah, they got to read on with the story. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. 
Yeah, don't mess with God. Yeah, he is gracious and merciful. There comes a point, man. Look out. And I'll tell you what, God's word will go forth. You may not because of your actions, but God's word will. You know, we again, we, we look at this world and we go, man, you know, they're shutting all Christian stuff down. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be bad. I think he's still on the throne. God does amazing, amazing things during intense persecution. Never negate that. He doesn't need us, but he will use us if we humble ourselves before him. Verse 11 says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So here Jesus is praying for two things. He's praying that they would be kept or protected. Yeah, there was difficult times ahead for these men. And he's praying for the Father to keep them, to protect them. And the Father did until it was time for them to go home. None of them are still alive today. There is a set time that we are going home. And God will keep us until that time. And the other prayer is that they should be one. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Unity is based in truth. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. But apart from truth, there can't be unity. Think about it. One person believes Jesus is the only way. The other person believes all roads lead to God. How are you united in that? You're not. Either they're right or they're right. Well, this person here who believes salvation is through Jesus alone. There is no other way to the Father except through him. They are right. And he'll find out. Hopefully he'll come to saving faith before them. But that's important. Truth is what unity is based on. And Jesus says, look, man, I've lost no one except for Judas. Jesus already knew what Judas was going to do. This is not a surprise. Did he still have a choice? I think he had a choice until Satan entered him. When they sat down for that Passover meal, and then Judas left before it was finished, before they shared in communion. Did he walk away from his salvation? I don't think so. I don't think he was ever saved. He was a terror amongst the wheat. He looked like wheat, but he wasn't. In fact, Jesus called him a devil in John 6, 70. So he wasn't saved. And John says in 1 John 2, 19, that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. You see, there are many people who come to church and either because of difficult times, persecution, whatever, they just walk away. Does that mean that they were saved and they're backsliding now or they were never saved? That's a tough one. God knows that. But they need Jesus, man. That's the answer. That's the key. It's tough. Tares look like the wheat. So we don't always know. But I don't think you can lose your salvation because you didn't do anything to obtain it in the first place except receive the gift by faith. Well, in verse 13 here, Jesus says this, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I, I think, you know, Jesus is talking about growing, sanctification process. And as we grow in the Lord, as we mature in the Lord, what ends up happening is the world hates us. Why? Because we're standing up for the things of God. 
from the moment we get saved, that process begins in our lives. And as the light of God shines upon our lives, the sin, they get mad, they get angry. And, you know, people today, you know, we've got all this uh, sexual harassment and all these allegations and all these things going on, right, in Hollywood, in the news media, in Washington, D.C., right? All this stuff is going on. People are like, how could this happen? You've been promoting it for years. And you're coming up with a generation of kids are getting fed so much sexual information, you better be prepared for what's coming. And they're going to hate it when we shine. So what the church does is they turn down the light so they look more like the darkness. And now there's no problem. That's exactly what we are not to do. We're to shine. Not be obnoxious, not be rude, not, you know, be sarcastic to them, but let them see what God is all about as we live our lives. I think that's important. And we should be growing in the Lord. And as we do, as we mature in the Lord and grow in the Lord and our eyes are upon him, then that joy should be overflowing in our lives. And I think for some Christians, man, that's a tough one. Why? I don't know. Because when I look at the scriptures, when I look at who Jesus is and what he's done for me, if I can't have joy over that, I will guarantee you there is nothing that will bring joy into your life then. If God saving you and loving you doesn't bring joy to your life, something's wrong. And what ends up happening, I think, many times is we move over to the world to find happiness, to find joy. And it's interesting because John says in 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Again, the church is not only dimming their light, the church wants to be like the world. And I wonder why they don't have joy. Well, you're not going to find joy in this world because the world constantly changes. And the things of this world are passing away. And I'll tell you, if you know, we as Christians don't understand that following Jesus, the world is not going to like what we, who we love, who we adore who we worship, if we don't understand that, we're going to be in trouble. They hated Jesus. Why, don't, why do you think they're not going to hate us? Of course they will. And Jesus says, look guys, he's praying for them. I don't want your father to take them out of the world. Darn it. <laughs> why? Well, because in this world, we're representing him, aren't we? We're ambassadors for Christ. We're shining for him. We don't isolate ourselves on some island. We're in the midst of this world, but the world's not in us. Think about a boat. A boat is, looks great, has a big engine in it, but it can't function unless it's what? In water. What happens, though, when water gets in the boat? It sinks. We as Christians are to function in this world. But when we let the world get in us, we sink. We need to be wise in the days we're living in. We need to be careful that we don't, you know, start looking down upon people and, you know, um, just belittling them. My wife could have done that before I got saved all the time. Put me down. But she didn't. She loved me. She shared with me. 
She was patient with me. And praise God, I came to saving faith. And we have to remember where we were at before we got saved. You know, there were people praying for us. There were people who were sharing Jesus with us. And they weren't beating us up. They weren't looking down upon us. Don't have the heart of a Pharisee. Have the heart of Jesus, who loved people. He loved sinners. I don't like what they do. I don't like what they, the things that they do to people. But God loves them, and we need to love them. He died for sinners. He didn't die for good people, because there are none. He died for sinners. Verse 17. Sanctify them, or set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. We are sanctified or set apart by the truth of God found in the word of God as we read it, hear it, apply it to our lives. Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You know, how important it is to take in God's word. And just like, I don't think many of us miss a day without eating. I, I think I'm pretty safe to say that. I think probably every day we eat. But are we partakers of God's word every day? And something the Lord has put upon my heart, and this is not, I'm not saying that you need to do this, but this is something the Lord put upon my heart, is I need to listen to God's word. And so now I'm in my car. You know, I went through the first eight chapters of Matthew driving around today. It's like, wow, eight chapters. That was, that's awesome. Because I want it to be in my mind and in my heart. Because even if I don't hear every single word, I know God is going to speak to me as I'm listening. I think it's important that we're in God's word. Because he shows us when we're going off base. He shows us what's in our heart. Why? He's sanctifying us or setting us apart by the truths that are in his word. Now, it also says in verse 19, Jesus says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself. Wait a minute. Is Jesus unclean? Well, again, what do the scriptures say? that he was without sin. He couldn't have any sin or he couldn't be the sacrifice for our sins, right? Then what's he saying? I think what this verse is saying, what it, how it is, uh, should be read is, I offer myself in sacrifice. Does that fit? Yeah, it fits perfectly. He, he was, had no sin in him, in him at all, none. So Jesus has prayed for himself. He's praying for his disciples. And there's another group of people he's going to pray for now here in verses 20 through 26. He prays for all believers. And I love this. Look at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You know who that is? That's us. <laughs> it's all believers. Wow. Wow. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. To me, that is amazing. That is awesome. I, I can't even, it, it sends shivers down my back, you know, just thinking about God praying for me. What a loving God we have. And he's going to also pray for unity with believers. Why? because he knows the divisions that will come over silly things, even non-doctrinal issues. And what's interesting is many times people fight over non-doctrinal issues, and yet when it comes to doctrine, they let it go. They don't fight over that. Kind of weird, but look at verse 21 that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for unity here. And this is not some ecumenical movement, just believe whatever you want, accept all things. Like I said, the unity is based in truth. 
And what did Jesus just get done saying? Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So there it is. Now we know what truth is. It's God's word. So, Jesus is the one who unites us together into the family of God. There's our unity. And it's based in the truths of God found in the word of God. And, man, as I was preparing for the pro our prophecy update coming up in a, in a month here, it's amazing as I look at the number of Protestant churches that are embracing Roman Catholicism and saying they are brothers and sisters in Christ. You have the seeker-friendly churches. You have the purpose-driven churches. You have the emerging church churches that are embracing Roman Catholicism. They think the Reformation was a mistake. Protestant churches are thinking the Reformation was a mistake. Yeah, I, I agree there are things that you know, weren't taken out far enough, but it was needed. And if you look at Roman Catholicism, it still says if you believe you're saved by grace alone, you are going to hell. And what is the Protestant church doing? They're signing agreements that we are brothers in Christ. How can we be unless we change what grace means? And we have. They didn't change their dogmas. So the Protestant church has. You see, they believe, yes, grace. They use the word grace. So they use a lot of Christian terminology, different meaning. Yes, Jesus died for our sins. But... You need to go to Mass. You need to make your, have to have baptism and communion and confirmation. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to light candles. You're saved by grace and works. And the Protestant church was buying into it. Is there unity there? No. Why? And if you want to email me and call me and send letters, you can do that. But they believe in a different Jesus. Why do I say that? because he's still hanging on the cross in the Roman Catholic Church. They believe in a different gospel message. Why? Because their gospel is, Jesus died for your sins and you have to do these works. It's a different gospel. We are saved by faith or grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. It's his finished work, not mine. Huge difference. And... Even in the end, they have to go to purgatory to complete their atonement for their sins. Now, here's the thing. If I'm God, and I know I'm going to have to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, but there's a place called purgatory where they can just go to and I don't have to come down. I'm not coming down. Go spend some time in purgatory. <clears throat> Remember, it's the eternal state. There's no time, so if you're there... A billion years, it's nothing, because there's no time there. So it doesn't really matter. So you atone for your sins in purgatory, then you get to heaven. Why do I need to come? And Jesus even said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. There wasn't. You see, unity that is not based in truth is not biblical unity. And it's dangerous. And these other issues, non-doctrinal issues, wow, I guess I don't understand it. Jesus says, look, by your unity, how you talk to each other, how you relate to each other, people will come to believe. They're going to see how you're living out your faith. And this is the area that people fight in. Tozer made this interesting comment. He said, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meet together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strife 
for closer fellowship. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do his will. Be in tune with him and you'll be in tune with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You do your own thing, you're out of tune. And that's what we see. Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. And by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The world looks at us. What do they see? Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Wow. Humility, compassion, suffering. Drawing us together. God has put his glory in us, guys. The knowledge of him. And we should be shining. People should see our love for God. Oh, verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave, gave me may be one with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus wants us kept apart for him, set apart for him, to be with other believers. That's That was what was on his heart before he was crucified. Because he knew there was going to be, I mean, think about it. They were arguing who's going to be greatest in the kingdom, right? Even at the night of the Last Supper, and Jesus had to wash their feet to show them what a true servant is all about. And here in verse 23 of John 17, Jesus said that he wants us to know how the Father loved them as you have loved them. You know that? You know how the Father loves you guys? I don't think we know the fullness of that. I think we look at the cross and we see what he did. He gave his son for us. But man, it's so rich and it's so deep. And to, to know that, to have it in writing here, he loves me. Look at verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. It's interesting how people in the world, how they think about God and see God, they kind of form a God out of their own imaginations of their own heart. And they don't know God. But we do. We know him through his love, through his word, through his spirit. One writer kind of summed it up like this. He said, that the love with which you love me may be in them. He said, Jesus received love from God the Father, and this love relationship was the strength and sustenance of his life. Here, concluding his great prayer, Jesus prayed that the same love that was his strength and sustenance would fill his disciples, both near and far. This speaks to the essential place of love in the Christian life and community. Jesus thought it so important that he specifically prayed for love when he might have prayed for many other things. Take love from joy and you only have hedonism or pleasure-seeking self-indulgence. Take love from holiness and you have self-righteousness. That was like the Pharisees. Take love from truth and you have bitter orthodoxy. Take love from mission and you have conquest. Take love from unity and you have tyranny. Make no mistake about it, guys. Without love, that agape love of God in our lives, we're not following the Lord. We're following our own interests. It's about us. And people will see that worldly love. They won't see that unconditional love of God, that agape love. And I'll tell you, if you you know, try to do this on your own, you will never succeed. There is no way. Um, it's, it's a battle because the flesh gets in the way. 
but man, to love people unconditionally. Jesus hanging on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Wow. In fact, Paul said in Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In word and deed, in all our actions, we do unto the Lord. We give thanks to God. All he's doing in our lives. We should be doing that with joy in our hearts and love in our actions, just as the Lord showed us. All this that Jesus is finishing up now with this wonderful prayer, right? And as you get into verse 18, John tells us, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. This is where we'll pick up next time. Jesus has crossed the brook Kidron, he's going to the garden of Gethsemane, where he will again be praying, sweating drops of blood, such intense pressure. And then a short time later, Judas, 600 soldiers, probably another 400 people, religious leaders and others who just gathered, are coming up to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. I'm sure Jesus saw him. It was night. Torches are lit. And here's this trail coming up the hill. You know how it is, you know, how they ski down a mountain at night and they have the little lights on and they go down this hill and it's pretty awesome. Well, here, Jesus knew exactly what they were coming for to arrest him. He knew what was before him. And we'll cover that next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful prayer and how encouraging it is to us, Lord, to know that Jesus is praying for us. He's interceding for us. He's, he cares deeply for us and Lord, you, Father, you love us so much, we can't even imagine. We just thank you, Lord. And Lord, our desire is to live for you. We want to shine so brightly that uh, the darkness will flee, that people will come to saving faith. And help us to do it with that agape love, not looking down upon people, not sitting on an ivory tower, but Lord, on the streets with them knowing we are sinners as well, but have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And that's exactly what those around us need, is that cleansing of the blood of Jesus upon their lives. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to be men and women of prayer, not only for our needs or our family needs or our neighbors, our friends, Lord, just the, our missionaries, there's so many we could be praying for. Put it upon our hearts, Lord. This prayer is so important, so powerful. It doesn't change your will, Lord, but it changes our heart to be conformed to your will. That's our desire. We thank you, Lord. And we just pray in Jesus' name. Amen.